Okay, so, uh, good morning, everybody. I think it is uh, ten twenty Indian time, and we will start our today's session. Uh, the first speaker will be Rosa Valenti from Frankfurt, and she will talk about magnetized coupling in time materials. But before Rosa starts, uh, Harald will say a few words. Uh, are you going to say that Yasi and Super are away or anyway? Well, no. Um, okay, just uh, just two things. Um, today uh, we um, don't have our two organizers, um, Yasir and um, Shubro, and therefore um, Carlo and me and Ludo are going to um, sort of um, organize things. And um, Yasir asked me to especially say that tonight at 7 p.m. there's a conference dinner um, where we have lunch. So um, out here. So please, everybody, come at 7 p.m. and Yes, yes, yes. And um, now it's Rosé's turn. Please go ahead, Rosé. Thank you, uh, Harald. Um, so I have exactly what, 35 minutes plus five minutes or 30 minutes plus 10 minutes? How is uh, it? I, I think you have 40 minutes. I have 40 we, we minutes. We you down okay. after 40 minutes. And if you want 30 plus 10 or 35 plus five, it's, I think, perhaps okay. up to you. OK, so thank you very much. And it's a pleasure for me to be here, even if it's only in, on an online forum. I hope next time I can come to this uh, uh, wonderful place. Um, today, I would like to talk about Kitayev material. So yesterday, um, you had already uh, Yuchi Matsuda probably talking about Kitayev uh, systems and the situation with these Kitayev candidates. What I want to do today is maybe to do a short overview about uh, what we know about this type of materials and especially make some emphasis about the role of magnetoelastic coupling in these systems. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my collaborators in the work I will present. So my group in Frankfurt, David Kaib, Kira Riedel, Sananda Bisbas, as well as Steve Winter, who was a postdoc in Frankfurt and now he's an assistant professor at Wake Forest in North Carolina. Uh, Ying Li, who is uh, also an assistant professor in Yang Yang. Yang Tong in China, as well as Johannes Knoll and Valentin Lieb, with whom we have been collaborating. And our experimental colleagues, um, especially for the work I will present, uh, Radu, Koldea, Eric Hendrickson, Adam Sen, um, my colleagues in Frankfurt, Ben Wolf, and Michael Lang, oh, sorry, it's Lang, <laughs> and um, Ben Bishnan and Anja Bolda in Dresden. So what I would like to present today is uh, first a short uh, overview about KITAF candidate materials. Then I will describe how we try to extract the microscopic information from these systems by doing a combination, whether there is an existence of a fill-induced intermediate spin liquid phase and which is the role of magnetoelastic coupling. So the, 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 the let's say the genesis of uh, this field uh, started with uh, this very simple model from the first point of view, uh, which is a nearest neighbor Ising model, which is bond dependent on a honeycomb lattice. So basically, um, if one thinks about the properties of the system, this is a highly frustrated uh, model Hamiltonian, since if you consider, for instance, the spin here at the center of this honeycomb lattice, this spin has to interact with the Z component with the neighbors up the up in the in the lattice, has to come then interact with the X comp so X uh, spin component on the right, and with the Y spin component on the left. And since the three spin components don't commute with each other, this is a highly frustrated model. This model, in fact, was introduced already in the 80s by Kugel and Komsky in the framework, um, in fact, by of what they were calling the compass model. And uh, the merit of Alexei Kitayev was that he has solved this model exactly by um, substituting the spin operators in terms of um, Majorana fermions. In fact, uh, spin operators, I should do that here, uh, the spin operators by four Majorana fermions, by doing substitu this substitution, the Hamiltonian becomes quadratic and it can be solved exactly. And the ground state is a Z2 spin liquid with gapless Majorana fermions and static gap fluxes. And moreover, under the application of a magnetic field, one um, finds out, in fact, this was shown by Alexei in his uh, 
paper, in his seminal paper, that um, you can um, obtain a chiral spin liquid with Majorana H states. So this was for a while a very nice model, but it remained at the level of um, theory until um, George Jacqueli and Guignard Calulin made the connection to materials. So if we want to now try to understand how we can have a realization of this Hamiltonian into material, maybe the best way is to write down the Hamiltonian for spin systems in the way we, we know. So by considering here, I just wrote the bilinear terms. So we will expect to have a Heisenberg contribution. Then if a spin orbit coupling is present, we may have a jalginsky moria contribution, as well as we may have also the so-called pseudo-dipolar contribution or the gamma tensor contribution. So now what um, George and Guinea did is basically to give a recipe how we could have um, this contribution basically to be the dominant contribution. In fact, as we will see in the next slide, this contribution corresponds to um, matrix element of this uh, pseudo-dipolar term. So they, um, the way they did that um, is basically, okay, let's consider that we have a metal um, with five or 40 electrons, since we need to have spin orbit coupling and with a feeling of five. And what we want now, the next step is uh, if um, we have now 5D electrons in uh, 5D orbitals, in principle, we need to have, uh, when we put this transition metal ion into the crystal, we are expecting some kind of, some, in fact, um, crystal field splitting. So the crystal sp splitting that we are looking for is an, um, ortho, uh, so basically that we have an, um, this type of ortho uh, rhombic um, crystal field splitting, where we will have the splitting into T2G uh, energy levels and EG levels. And the reason why we want that is because now in these T2G levels with 5D electrons, if you had 5D electrons, this would be the, uh, so D5 uh, electrons, this would be the filling. And now if spin orbit coupling is important, we are going to do an ex, uh, have an extra splitting due to the spin orbit coupling that um, leaves us into J effective three half and J effective one half. So the end of the combination of crystal field splitting and um, a spin orbit coupling, we have one half field orbital, which has a, a, a nature of J effective one half. So it's a spin orbit coupled state. And now if the system is strongly correlated, we expect this to extra split due to the um, Coulomb repulsion. And then we have what we wanted, a localized um, spin orbit. Um, uh, uh, so a spin orbit, so it's not a, a purely spin state, but a spin orbit state, um, which is one half. And now we have to construct um, how this is going now to interact with the other spins in the lattice, oops, sorry, with the other spins in the lattice. And um, basically the way to do that is to uh, put now this octahedra in a honeycomb. So basically we have, we need C3 symmetry. So in a honeycomb uh, construction, so by H sharing. And if we have a perfect H sharing, so what we expect is that the, Heisenberg contribution, so the Heisenberg interaction between J, these two J effective um, spins, which for, from now on we call them spins, but um, it's in fact a spin orbital coupled um, object. So this interaction is going to be zero because we have this destructive interaction through the two path of interaction due to this 90 degree uh, path. Now, if the system has inversion symmetry, as we have um, usually in these uh, honeycomb lattices, then the jalginsky moria um, term contribution disappears, as well as a few of these uh, gamma term contributions. And now what we are left with is indeed a higher order spin-spin um, contribution, which is um, in fact a second order spin contribution, which is through this J effective three half, so I don't have the picture here, it's okay. So which uh, these three effective G, uh, three half, so that what we see is that the, the energy scales that play a role into these uh, higher order contributions 
are the Huns coupling as well the, the of course the hopping parameters the Hubbard U and the spin orbit coupling and this um, contribution through the uh, three half uh, terms is a nice type of contribution and this is the Kitaev contribution so basically if we um, have this type of materials fulfilling these uh, conditions we are going to expect important Kitaev contributions. And this is a multi-orbital, um, it has a multi-orbital origin as you see here. So um, from that uh, work, then of course, many materials started to pop up. Um, these are the so-called 2D candidate materials, the iridates and alpha ruthenium trichloride, but they are, they are also three-dimensional um, propositions of these possible presence of um, this type of interaction, like the uh, beta and gamma lithium iridate, and now more recently, this uh, hydrogen doped uh, lithium iridate. Now, the point is all these systems in fact order, except for this one here. Um, the, there is a lot of discussion about the non long range order in this um, hydrogen lithium iridate, whether this order is playing an important role there. But um, here I'm going to concentrate mostly on alpha ruthenium trichloride. So now what, what we are interested in is uh, extracting these spin interactions from uh, an up initial perspective. So by starting with the elementary equations, uh, Schrodinger Dirac equation, and then extracting from these uh, calculations where we put all the information of the atoms and the electrons in the lattice, extract these. Um, in fact, there's exchange interactions. And of course, there are many ways to do this type of calculation. So what we um, I'm just um, flash out here is one way that we found out that it is very uh, effective to obtain this type of spin interactions, which is by um, combining density functional theory calculations with exact diagonalization. So the idea is um, starting with a density functional theory calculation with, where it gives information about the electronic structure of the systems. And from this calculation, basically by banerizing the, uh, the band structure, you can, obtain, you can obtain information about the hopping matrix elements in your system. Then from this first step, you build up a complete um, multi-orbital Hubbard model, including all the effects of crystal fields of uh, spin orbit coupling. And uh, this complete Hubbard model is then uh, solved by exact diagonalization on uh, different uh, cluster sizes. And since we have this crystal field splitting between the T2G and the EG uh, states, due to the fact that all these materials have this uh, octahedral environment of the uh, transition metal ion, then we expect to have an, a charge gap between the low lying spin states and the high lying spin states. And because we are interested in the low energy uh, region of, the, of our spin Hamiltonian, so we basically now from this exact di uh, diagonalization, we stay with these um, low lying energy states. And then what we do is um, we choose a basis, which is a basis with which we are going to describe this uh, spin Hamiltonian uh, for the case of these Kitaev materials. It's basically the J effective one half, three half basis. And we do the projection um, of these states in, with these bases. And with that, one can one obtains um, a spin Hamiltonian that fulfills all the symmetries of the system and contains, of course, uh, all these uh, information about the chemistry of the system. So now by doing this exercise on the, let's here I'm showing, for instance, these two-dimensional Kitaev materials, alpha ruthenium trichloride, sodium iridate, alpha lithium iridate. So if you look at, um, this is now uh, and the extensive Hamiltonian. So this, would, this is the Kitaev coupling, um, Heisenberg coupling, and then these are all the components of this um, gamma tensor that I was showing to you. So for instance, to understand what it, I'm going to talk uh, uh, later on about the gamma term, the gamma term, the gamma term is basically interactions that um, if you are considering that you are at the, uh, for instance, at the Z bond, gamma is equal to Z. So this gamma interaction corresponds between these two spins 
that you have Sx, Sy, and Sy, Sz. So this is the gamma term in a given Hamiltonian that is also, of course, bond dependent. So now what, uh, what one observes is that on all these materials, Kita F is indeed the strongest, uh, uh, the strongest interaction. So in alpha ruthenium trichloride, it's five mil electron ball. And uh, in the case of the iridase, it's, uh, it's basically, uh, um, uh, the scale is uh, larger. That's, in fact, this is one of the reasons why one is working mostly with this material apart from the samples. Um, but also, as well as this interaction, there are other interactions that are non-zero. Um, so here in this um, phase diagram of the interactions, all these materials have ferromagnetic KTF interactions. Uh, they are all in this region, but they also have other interactions that are non-zero. And due to the presence of these other exchange interactions, these materials all order at low temperatures. None of them show a spin liquid behavior as um, hoped. Um, and what I want to show you in the next slide, going into this, um, this uh, the title of my talk about the importance of magnetoelastic coupling, I want to show you where do these co contributions come from? So why do we have these contributions? And one cannot ignore them trying, when trying to understand the properties of these materials. So let me start, uh, for instance, with a very, simple, um, a very simple effect that we have in all these materials which is the presence of a trigonal field. So this octahedral environment of your uh, transition metal ion is not perfect. So if we, if we are in a perfect octahedral environment, um, then of course, when we apply spin orbit coupling, we have a perfect splitting of our J1 half and J3 half. However, in these materials, you may have elongation of this um, octahedral, or you may have compression. And this, uh, this, the presence of this effect, what it's doing is, is reshuffling your state. So changing your crystal field splittings. And of course, it's changing also accordingly, it's changing the projection into this J effective uh, one half and three half. Um, and of, on more, more importantly, you may be quenching the orbital degrees of freedom totally. And then there is no option to uh, show a Kita F interaction. And this is what is shown on the right hand side. So if we had no trigonal field elongation, so this is um, now the contribution of the kita F would be maximally, and there is no contribution of the other term, so here is my zero. But now switching on, or switching on this trigonal uh, field, basically you see that if, the, um, if this is a, a negative uh, elongation, we're basically quenching the orbital degrees of freedom and Heisenberg, you, you go into the Heisenberg limit. Or on the other side, you can, we go into the Ising limit. Um, and of course, this is having as well effects on the G factor and the G factor is going to be important when we want to study what happened with these materials on the a magnetic field. Was there Second, sorry, a question? Yes. Me. Yeah, so I mean, uh, when we look at the, 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 the compound itself, the yes. octahedron is not anymore. I mean, even even if we look at the kind of material without any pressure from the side, the, yeah. the octahedron is already distorted. Yes, yes. And this trigonal field that you are talking here about is it addition to that? No, is the one that the one that they present without applying any pressure, nothing. I see. So, so they are already distorted. I'm talking about this distortion that they. Okay. Right, already present not like stretching in the around okay thank so you. this distortion is there in the crystal because of course you have um you have uh um, so so they are in 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 the the atoms they are distributed in a certain way and uh, it's a van der Waals system that this one for instance uh or the others have sodium or lithium so they are doing some uh, they are not allowing the system to be in a perfect octahedral environment. So it's already there built in, in the crystal. And this is, um, so without applying any pressure, nothing. So this is a, so, a so, pressure. So, 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 yeah, I, I think I didn't say it right. So what I mean is that the, the honeycomb lattice has the C3 symmetry. Yes. Yeah, so is this with that C3 symmetry that the, that the- The C3 that, symmetry, you can preserve it uh, even if you have this trigonal distortion. So the C3 symmetry is, um, in fact, in the materials, there is a, okay, so this is a, a very good question. In these materials, um, 
you have a little, so the, the bonds are not perfectly equally, but one can make the approximation of symmetrizing that. But um, so this is, uh, I guess that you go into the question, do I preserve still C3 symmetry or, do, or don't I present, preserve? So, um, and this is something that uh, is indeed related to many other types of distortions that you have in these systems. Here, I'm just presenting one, but um, usually the, the C3 symmetry is very, so the fact that your bonds are not exactly the same, then if you want to, we, we check that. It's not affecting very much the results, but you have to pay attention whether your C3 symmetry is preserved or not. Um, the, and the C3 symmetry also depends on what kind of stacking you are having. So indeed is a symmetry there that you can still uh, consider to be fulfilled. Um, and uh, it, it's not affecting too much the results. What is affecting the results is, is, this, is this kind of distortions. Did I answer your question? Yeah, Carlo? thank you, thank you. Okay, so, but there is, let me talk about the second effect. So this was only one ion effects, but of course now we have the, the orbitals that are there and the other ones that are defining the, in fact, the, the hybridization between the different atoms and therefore they are defining also at the end of the day, the spin, uh, spin interactions. So, and what I want to show here is, is a very delicate dependence on, um, if we look now at two neighbor um, ruthenium with, uh, for instance, the alpha ruthenium dichloride with their octahedra, uh, if we look now at which are the orbitals that are contributing to these um, interactions, and here I basically, what, we, um, what I'm showing here is the expressions of these interactions, if you obtain them, by doing perturbation expansion um, on the multi-orbital Hubbard model. So you can also obtain them in an analytical form by doing perturbation expansion in, in one of where you and, um, of this uh, Hamiltonian. And now what you see is that by I'm showing here on the right is uh, these are the different hopping paths that uh, we may expect to be the dominant ones. So this is between, uh, for instance, this is the most important one, in fact, this called T2, which is the one that is responsible for the Kitaev interaction. But then we may also have these, uh, for instance, on the same orbital, so this uh, DXZ, DXZ, or as well as the DX, uh, y, DXY, so this, what we call the direct hoppings. And depending on just changing a little bit this angle here, which is shown here, um, the value of these interactions changes drastically. So shown here is, for instance, that if you are exactly at 90 degrees, and if these materials would only have this uh, hybridization, then of course, Kita F would be the only interaction there. However, you also have contributions of this type of hybridizations of hoppings, and these are responsible then for the presence of an important gamma term as well as a J1. So if you want to just make these two interactions disappear. In fact, you have to um, just open this angle a little bit further than 90 degrees to go into a region where Kitaev um, is going to dominate over the, uh, the other two. So, so that shows you that, in fact, the, the, there is contributions from other hybridizations that are in, uh, contributing to not only having a Kitaev contribution in the system. Nevertheless, even though there are, um, there are other contributions, Kitayev is the most important one. And because of the presence of these contributions that are other than a Heisenberg contribution, so these very anisotropic contributions, the, um, in the excitations in these systems are extremely interesting. So they are not the excitations that you would expect for um, a purely Heisenberg system. And this is shown here, for instance, these are in elastic neutron scattering experiments from Oak Ridge um, at a temperature, which is a temperature uh, where the system in fact is ordered. It shows a zigzag order. And you can observe that there, there is very nicely um, magnon excitations corresponding to this order. But on top of that, there is all this continuum of, of, continuum of excitations that is already telling you that uh, there are very, spin anisotropic contributions in this system. 
And there is a lot of discussion, and there has been and is a lot of discussion about the nature of these excitations. Um, so here on the left is the calculations that we did by using these models and then um, doing exact diagonalization of this model on a cluster of 24 sites, where one can see that one can reproduce this uh, excitation spectrum with this continuum. Now, of course, this is a numerical calculation. So the interpretation of the origin of this continuum, you cannot do it from this calculation. So basically the calculation tells you these models are good models, but what is the origin? So uh, is this a soup of Majorana and um, fluxes? What is that? So this is the discussion that we have nowadays, but definitely not. I mean, I am of the opinion these are not independent Majorana excitations as uh, the purely Kitaev model would predict because of these uh, other contributions here. Now, these type of models reproduce a lot of um, experiments, so they are in principle good models. Now, um, of course, after this uh, long range order uh, is there, so, uh, and we have the prediction by a Kitaev of the purely Kitaev model that by applying a magnetic field, you can in fact um, create a chiral spin liquid with, um, with Majorana, uh, with Majorana excitation. So this was one of the sort of possibilities that one thought, okay, maybe what we can do is apply a magnetic field just suppress the long, this long range order and maybe hope for having an intermediate phase where this uh, type of uh, chiral spin liquid may emerge before the system field polarizes when the magnetic field is very large. And um, I'm going to talk a little just uh, shortly because uh, I guess Yuji uh, yesterday did uh, probably a longer in fact, a much, much longer description on that. But just let me uh, show you at least what, what has been done up to now and why this field has boosted a lot was because of these measurements uh, in the group of Yuji Matsuda in 2018 of the thermal hole conductivity. So um, basically what they did is they applied a magnetic field uh, parallel to the plane. And in fact, it's important the direction of the magnetic field because of these uh, very anisotropic spin interactions, you, uh, you have of course a very anisotropic response. So if you want to um, get rid of this uh, zigzag order, so suppress the zigzag order, the, um, the easy, the easy axis is the easy plane. So in the perpendicular direction, this is the hard axis of the system, and you have to apply magnetic fields of 70 Tesla uh, at least to um, to suppress the long range order. So you should apply your magnetic field uh, parallel to the to the honeycomb plane. So what they observe is that when they apply these magnetic fields along the along the A direction is that there is a region, so after suppressing the zigzag order, there is a region of fields where the thermal hole conductivity is quantized, and the quantization that they observe is precisely the quantization predicted by Kitaev for the Kitaev model. And this, of course, then one starts to um, uh, try to understand uh, this behavior, and there has been now many uh, groups doing this experiment. And the problem is that the groups that do, they don't agree with each other. So for instance, here is Le Francois and collaborators. So in the group of Louis Taifer, where they don't observe any quantization of the thermal hole conductivity. Um, this is the group of Ong, who took the same samples as uh, Yuji Matsuda, and they don't see quantization in the thermal hole conductivity. However, in the thermal conductivity, they see this uh, phenomenon of, of oscillations as a function of magnetic field in the thermal conductivity. And there is the group of Hide Takagi, so young poem uh, collaborations and collaborators, where um, they don't find quantization of the thermal hole conductivity. Um, and uh, in fact, they explain these oscillations in the thermal conductivity as a possibly as a consequence of having a, a cascade of uh, phase transitions due to the presence of stacking falls in, in this system. So 
As you see, there is experiment, and of course, there is also um, Christian Hess in uh, uh, now in Wuppertal, who also has done a lot of experiments, and he also does in sequentization of thermal hole conductivity. So you see that there is a lot of discussion from the experimental, already at the experimental level, about the presence or not of this um, intermediate phase. I just wanted to show this slide on thermodynamic properties and a collection of many other, many other experiments that have done, been done in this material. So here I'm presenting um, the thermodynamic measurement. So in fact, the magnetic Grunison parameter from Philip Gegenbart and collaborators. The magnetic Grunison parameter is an extremely sensitive um, thermodynamic quantity to measure phase transitions. And here, what we see is that this is uh, this parameter as a function of magnetic field, precisely in the direction that so many of these groups are looking at. And um, there is a strong phase transition at about between six and seven uh, Tesla, which is the uh, which uh, which is shown by this um, typical behavior of the Grunison parameter when it hits a phase transition um, of second order, where you have uh, the suppression of the six-sack order. But then um, is here a little bit harm that uh, it's not, uh, you cannot uh, identify as a phase transition, but then the system is basically not showing. Uh, so basically going continuously to this um, partially polarized phase. This other transition here, this is a transition within the six-sack phase, which also has been observed in neutron scattering experiments where the Q vector, um, the six-sack Q vector changes and it's due to uh, the three dimensionality. Now here, what I have, uh, what we have plotted is again, as a function of magnetic field, the experimental evolution of the excitation energies uh, that have been uh, reported in different measurements. And you see that basically this is the lowest excitation energy reported that there is uh, here, it's the zigzag phase. So the excitation energies come into uh, values uh, between um, so six and, and nine, and then the next excitation that would correspond continuously to this to this partially polarized or fully polarized. If you go to infinite um, uh, magnetic fields, infinite uh, of infinite value, so it's very hard to say here that you um, that you are having a distinct intermediate phase because if it's a spin liquid phase. This is dynstic, so it's a non topologically non-trivial phase. Um, your ordered phases are, to are topologically trivial, so you should have thermodynamically, in fact, a, a phase transition showing. So you see the dispute about um, which is the origin, uh, or whether you have this intermediate phase or not. I just want to say in this phase diagram, just to show you that how anisotropic is are these systems on the magnetic field. So all the discussions. So this is the angle of putting the magnetic field parallel to the to the honeycomb lattice or perpendicular, and um, here is the ordered phase, and this would be now the region of discussion. So all the experiments are in fact uh, working in this region. If you start putting a, a field out of plane, you should go to these very high fields, which of course experimentally is uh, much more challenging. So these are the two scenarios that uh, are being discussed uh, since a few years, whether you have, uh, in fact, you go from the six second deformer magnetic phase then to this field polarized phase, and you may be having a quantum critical point, or the second scenario um, suggested by uh, the measurements in Tokyo that you have an intermediate spin liquid phase. So this is the discussion. But I don't want to go further into this discussion. I want to show you an alternative way of, in fact, reaching the spin liquid phase. Um, and, in, and as we saw that these materials, the exchange interactions are extremely sensitive to um, very small changes in the structure. So a way of manipulating these interactions is by applying uh, strain fields, either pressure or strain. And this is what I'm going to investigate in the next slide. So the first thing that you can think of is if I want to now change these interactions, uh, let's apply pressure. Um, so what happens, however, when you apply pressure, 
Here I'm showing conductivity experiments by uh, Martin Dressel and collaborators where they follow the phonons, especially this, uh, this one, this e, e, EU phonon. So what, now what happens when you apply pressure is that um, here I'm showing again these uh, different uh, hopping paths that, that are playing a role in the interactions is that you're starting to make this uh, interaction path the important one. So, and at some critical pressure, what is happening is that you have a binding, so bonding, anti-bonding, and the system in fact distorts. So there is a structural transition um, to a distorted phase where you form these short bonds. So there's a distortion and what happens then is you have spin singlets. So there is magnetism is gone. And this distortion is observed um, here, for instance, in this conductivity uh, by following this phonon that you find at about one gigapascal, there is a splitting of this phonon corresponding to this distortion. So pressure is not, uh, in fact, um, the way to go if you want to shift the system into the region where only KITAF would survive. Um, what I want to show here is recent res uh, measurements by Michael Lang and Bern Wolf and his group where they played with very small pressures um, okay. because five it's... Minutes. How many? Five. Five to the end. Okay. Five they to the 40 minutes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I have now three more slides and then... So, so then uh, what, they did, what they find is that by applying these uh, very small pressures, uh, you can, what, you, what one says, heal the sample. So one problem of these samples is the stacking force. So... And these stacking falls, you can see the presence of a stacking falls in, in that you have, in fact, more than one uh, transition temperature, so uh, nil transition temperature. So they can heal these uh, samples by applying very small pressures, and one can see that also uh, theoretically as we did with the simulations. Another way of applying um, uh, pressure, which is uh, in the sense of going to this uh, spin liquid uh, region is uh, apply uniaxial strain. Because when you apply uniaxial strain, basically you are expanding this uh, honeycomb lattice and the expansion of the honeycomb lattice is going to get rid of these direct hoppings, which is one, what uh, is harming basically your, um, your KITAF, be purely KITAF. So what we did is simulations of, this, of these different type of strains, either compressive or tensile. And then what you can do is um, analyze the exchange interactions as a function of strain, as well as the G factor. And let me go to, to this um, here on the right. So one sees that by applying this uniaxial strain where you basically expand the honeycomb lattice, the KITAF interactions indeed increases uh, and increases uh, rather strongly and you are get, getting rid of these non kitaf interactions. So this is in fact a, a very promising um, type of experiment. And then you can extract out of that by the, doing the derivatives, the magnetoelastic couplings. And to see that this um, type of um, calculations does, do have anything to do with reality, we compare for instance with magnetostriction experiments from, from Dresden. The magnetostriction is basically the response of the lattice when you apply a magnetic field so what one observes is that when you come into this transition where you, where the zigzag is um, suppressed, that the lattice has a very strong response to that. And this is what this magnetoelastic coupling shows. And these are here the theory calculations with these models that I was showing to you, which indeed is describing properly this effect. And what is interesting is which is the, what, from this anisotropic interaction, which is the one contributing to this effect. So, um, and the last slide is um, the work we have been doing with Johannes Knoller, another way of manipulating your, um, your uh, ruthenium trichloride is by creating a terror structures here with uh, graphene, because there is a strong mismatch, then um, alpha ruthenium trichloride will try to adapt to this, um, to this graphene lattice. So we expect effects of strain, as well as doping. Um, and in fact, there is an important charge transfer from the, uh, as can be seen in calculations, from the graphene layer to the alpha ruthenium trichloride, so that the graphene layer gets holed up, as it can be seen here. This is the Fermi level now of this heterostructure, and alpha ruthenium trichloride gets um, electron doped. 
And this type of heterostruction show an enhancement of Kitayev interactions. Um, and uh, now they, in fact, they are, one can even use these uh, heterostructures for more application purposes. And this is what Eric Henriksen um, has been um, recently doing, where in fact he showed that you can create very sharp lateral p injunctions. So, um, and these are our calculations where one sees that this charge transfer, uh, in fact, is uh, changes very sharply at the edges, and this can be used um, for practical, so for technological purposes. So, with that, my time is over. I come to my summary. Um, I, uh, with my talk, I wanted to just uh, present the importance of the magnetoelastic coupling in these uh, Kitayev materials. And uh, I have talked about two ways of going more into the direction of having this uh, Z2 spin liquid, or at least a chiral spin liquid, uh, emerging in these systems, um, which is either by applying a magnetic field or by making use of this very strong magnetoelastic coupling. Uh, so applying uh, pressure or strain or creating interstructures. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk. Now, are there, yes. so are there any questions from the audience? Uh, sorry, I, uh, are there any questions from the online audience? Oh, that's too early yet. Harald, yes. Yep. Um, thank you very much, Jose, for um, this, this nice presentation. Now, uh, you um, told us um, briefly about this controversy um, on thermal conductivity. And um, in, uh, within this controversy, there's a controversy about um, crystal structures, about um, growth methods. Now, as you have been... Um, working a lot on, on the crystal structure. Do you um, have a perspective on um, uh, what could be at the heart of um, these different samples and um, different measurement results? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Harald. So this is why I was presenting this one slide from Michael Lang. The point is um, that uh, one should do X-ray, for instance, at low temperatures because the structure at low temperatures is not, uh, is not well uh, defined. And um, in this material, so there are two structures that one is mostly discussing. One is the C2M structure. So, and the other one is in fact a rhomboidal structure. And the difference between the two is the C2M structure you're stacking is like that. So, uh, so like that, check. So check, check, check. In the, C, in, the, in, the, in the rhomboidal structure where you have higher symmetry, it has a, an angle tilting. And the difference between these two structures, it has to do with indeed these stacking falls uh, that people are talking about. And uh, of course, now it's not, many people are, don't know whether they have a C2M structure or they have a rhomboidal structure. And for that, you need to do in the, so the way that, the people are associating the crystal structure with um, whether they are more in the rhomboedral structure or in the C2M is by doing the magnetism. So by, by looking what kind of um, magnetic, um, uh, magnetic phase transitions they have. If they have a, a very clean one magnetic phase transition at low temperatures, so, one, so this is associated to, with less um, stacking faults that you may have this rhomboedral stacking. Um, and this rhomboidal are stuck, and then you have this ABC. I don't know how you worked also a long way back. I, if you remember, there was this ABC or this AB stacking. So this is the difference between the two. So if you have an ABC, it's in the case where you are expecting much less uh, stacking force. But still, this is as well a uh, discussion. And the, the, the point is, there are not not experiments or x-ray experiments at very low temperatures where one can tell you, okay, your structure uh, is this one or is the other one. So this is part of the, of the discussion as well. Right. So now um, um, stacking is, of course, along uh, C direction. And um, you have been uh, nicely explaining um, all the in-plane um, couplings. Yes. Uh, Hand-waving um, argument why um, in-plane 
behavior could change when you stack the material differently? No. Um, in this, okay. Um, okay, it changes. Let me show you that here. Okay, for instance, this, so the, the if you look, so this is Van der Waals. So if you look at the interactions between the in-plane and the out-of-plane, it's an order of magnitude different. Where these interactions start to be important indeed is when, if you, for instance, you are working with magnetic fields, when you're magnet, so when you are at energy scales, where this third interaction is should be important. And this is, uh, you see, no, here you don't see it, but when you apply magnetic fields where your magnon um, basically is going down in, um, in energy. So you are reaching energy scales that where the third direction is going to be comparable, then you have to worry about this third interaction. But the physics, uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue of energy scales. As far as the energy scales of the two-dimensional case are much larger than the three-dimensional case, you don't have to worry them so much. Only when you have, let's say, magnetic fields or you are applying an external um, perturbation where your scales are being reshuffled, then you should uh, pay attention to this, uh, third, to this third contribution. And this is seen, in fact, in this um, experiment uh, Oh, where was my Grunheisen parameter, for instance? Exactly. So the fact that there is this um, phase here is because you start to have a Q vector where the third, uh, so the, st the stacking, and here's where it's important, in the third direction is important because you are defining a magnetic order along the Z direction as well. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah, this is a very important question. Thank you. Anybody still having some urgent question? I don't see any in the audience, I mean online audience. Nobody is raising his hand or her hand or whatever. So I think we shall thank again Rosa for the talk. Thank and you very much.